Welcome everyone to Research Software Hour number four. I'm Richard Darst. And I'm Adovan. And for those of you who are with us the first time, this will be about programming, research software development, some Linux, some Git, maybe some high performance computing. Yeah, basically all the stuff that you might learn from your friends or colleagues in your office, but you might not. So, yeah, what's on the schedule for today? I think we would like to start with, we would like to get more questions. And um, we want to make sure that everybody knows how to, how and where to ask these questions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I can maybe show that if you, maybe you can give me the screen share. Maybe. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. No. Yes, there you are. All right, and now we will experience infinity effects here. <laughs> so this is the Twitch part here below is the hack and D link. I will follow that link. And this is how it looks in view mode, but I can switch to edit mode. And here we can ask some questions, but we would we would really love to hear questions from you. And we also want to ask you a question. We would like to ask you the question, and that question is, uh, what did you learn recently that you are really excited about? It can be technology, it can be something else. Yeah, it could be, it could feed in into future topics. And here you can, you can then write. And I can switch here between pure edit mode, so, or you can have edit and view. Mm -hmm. And here's the view mode. Yeah. So we would love to hear. What did you learn recently that you are really excited about? And yeah. In the meantime, I can... So not just now, but any time during the uh, session, if you have something you want to say, you can just write it in here and we'll either discuss it right away or discuss it later or answer it sometime. So at the end of the session, this becomes uh, open on our website. So you can always refer back to these answers. Yes, we add them to, the, to every session at the, at the bottom of the session. Uh, and also during, during the call, if questions come up, please write them here. We would really like to also get questions that we don't know how to answer. That will be, I think, the best. And in the meantime, we can maybe start with uh, I wanted to ask you about this Git version identifier. Ah, yeah. I heard men mentioned some Let's time ago. Let's see. So I will switch back to my screen. Yeah, there I am. So Let's see. So there was some comment last time about how to get a version identifier from Git. So I tried to discover it right away and didn't quite get it, but it turns out it's git describe head. So if I do this, it shows the latest tag from wherever we are. Um, let's try to get checkout upstream the latest master but this assumes that you have a uh, tags on right. the repository right yeah so if you if you don't have tags it might not say anything but i think there's some options that you can make it always print out the git hash even if there's no tags in the repository yet i'm not sure how that works exactly but it's an idea so here we see there's version number and then the number of commits since that tag. Actually, this is just a tag name, which could be a version number or might not be. Number of commits from it, and then G, which represents Git, and then the hash of it. Um, if you use, so here I'm checking out the old tag and I describe it. So now my current position is exactly at this tag. If I give it always, 
Oh, always doesn't work. Long, then it always shows the hash here. And this is what I will use next. I know there's no tags here, so it says it can't find anything. Ah, so if I do describe head with always, it will say just the hash of it. So this can be a good thing to embed in your stuff to print out exactly what version has been run. Um, one way, also one idea connecting to what we talked about last time would be to get this information into the output of the of the program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's for you to figure out for your particular program. But I'll just close the window here. There's a lot of noise coming here. Just so I'll be back in a sec. OK. So maybe I should go on to the next topic, which is workflows. So I've got this project I would like to talk about. And right. yeah, anything else on this topic? I was about to go on. Yeah, maybe let's go on. Yeah, OK. So this repository I'm in is called Board Game Networks. So it's something that I will work on and develop over um, a little bit of time with you all here. And we will basically improve it together. Um, so what we've got, so this is supposed to be some open data. So networks of board games. So if we look, uh, let's look at the readme down here. So this is based on board games that you that you play, that you like? Yeah, well, some, some that I like, some that I just found that had networks in them. And then, um, yeah. So my previous life was a network scientist. So I want more network analysis of these games. So since I don't have time to do it myself, the least I can do is make the data and hope someone else follows up and does the analysis. So that's sort of my long-term goal here. Um, hmm. Do you think I can show a picture of the pandemic board game network without it being copyright problem? I think that's fair use. Yeah. Me. So I'm searching pandemic game. Let's see. Uh -huh. mm, here we go. So we see here. There is different cities with connections between the cities. And it's this network of the city connections, which is what I want to digitalize in this project. So I've done it for, well, a few different board games so far. I've got more I want to do. If we look at the actual files in here, what's committed is a YAML file. And this YAML file contains sort of the different nodes in there, the labels. So in this case, there's different colors of the different nodes. I guess this should be a bit bigger, huh? And when did you start uh, working on this? Uh, a few months ago, I think. And then here I've got the, for each city, the different nodes it's connected to. So I designed this format here to be a bit redundant. So basically, I could enter a bunch of stuff, and then there'd be a program that would run on it and check the integrity of all the files or all the links. So for example, I might forget to enter one link because, well, I'm human, but then I want to enter them both directions. So the post-processing step ensures that they're connected both ways, and then I will if, if one of them is missing, it will tell me I'm wrong um, as a sanity check. And then it will go and save the output in this link here, which I've already opened. So here we see it converts it to a lot of different types of files, to a GML file, which is, I mean, something, graph modeling language, edge list. I'm not sure what this kind of format is. And these are the formats that can be used to visualize it. Yes. And mm -hmm. so there are a few standard formats. 
And in the repository here, there's the file parse.py, which does the parsing. So as you might expect, it's undocumented because, well, it's new code. Um, there's one function called generate, which does a bunch of magic, which is not our main topic here. There's a main function which gets arguments and opens the graph, prints stuff, prints statistics, and then, well, it runs it as a script. But this script is not what we're here to talk about today. So we're here to talk about workflows. So we've got all this data that comes as an input, and I want it to end up in GitHub pages as an output somehow. So how do we do this? Well, this is a perfect case for workflow automation. So today we're just going to talk about the make file in here. And over the next few sessions, we'll gradually improve this to use something a bit more fancy than a make file. And then we'll use GitHub Actions um, to process it. Oh. Yeah, I will also mention GitHub Actions a little bit later, and we should also have a look at GitHub Actions in, in the perspective of testing. Yeah. But I think it's a really nice use case. So the goal would be that every time you push a change, GitHub Actions is running and updating the website. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, so right now it uses the make file to automatically make the new um, data, but it does not... I have to do it manually on my own computer. So do you get the general idea of what the workflow management here will do and why I have it? Mm -hmm. Clearly, I don't want to go running parse.py on every file separately because that's sort of a, well, waste of my time. Um, so let's open a make file and take a look at it. So make file is a very old way of automating workflows. I don't know how long it's been around. Radovan, do you know? I guess, is it 60s uh, or 70s? I think, uh, I think it is over 40 years old. Yeah. Uh, it's like the late 70s. Yeah. So the one advantage of it is that it exists everywhere. I don't know if there's any other advantages to it other than being really simple for really simple tasks. But I guess there's other things that are as simple too. Yeah, but it is still, it's, I think the one reason why it's still around, it's, it's useful. It's yeah. really useful. It's still yeah. useful, 2020. Yeah. So for a workflow task that's this big, I don't know if I would really, uh, someone on HackMD just said it's from 1976, so I guess about a decade older than us, more or less. <sighs> yeah, at least a decade older than me. So, yeah. So it's a relatively simple format, but can get really, really messy when you start looking at it. But it's still what I always go to when I need to basically make something that would be a simple, simple shell script, but has some simple dependencies and is a first version of something. It's really good at expressing dependencies. And I think many people associate it with compiling, but it's not only for that. And in fact, in this case, you will see that it can be used for workflows. Mm -hmm. So here's my make file. I entered some extra blank spaces here in order to um, copy it up as we go over it. So we see at the top there's inputs and extensions and outputs. So what does this mean? This is sort of some make syntax to find all of the YAML files in directories. And then outputs converts all of the inputs. It changes their extensions from YAML to GML. So you may ask, how does anyone know this syntax? And believe me, you don't. Well, at least I don't. I don't know if anyone has any hope of knowing make syntax. I normally take a make, make file that works and I adjust it yeah. iteratively. That's how I think every make file <laughs> has been written. Yeah. So then we have rules and stuff. So let me find a rule down here to copy. 
Uh, here's one. So this rule says for every GML file, so um, what does percent mean is the wildcard here. The input dependency is the same percent.yaml and parse.py is a dependency. And then we run python3 parse.py. So this here dollar sign less than means the first input. Again, it's something that you're just not going to know um, unless you look it up. The question that just came in, so how do yeah. Macfast know which source files have mm -hmm. been changed? Because yeah. it doesn't, I mean, the, I think the interesting thing about Macfast is it doesn't rebuild everything every time. Yeah. That's the big advantage. Yeah, so this is done via the timestamps. So basically, it looks at the modification time of every file, and if this file is older than any of these, then it will not rebuild it. If any of these are newer, no. If this is newer than this, it will not rebuild it. If any of these are newer than the output, then it will rebuild it. Uh, so that one can also make, make files give them a look at checksums. Yeah. So it is possible to not make it look at timestamps, but at checksums. Oh, really? In make itself? Mm -hmm. hmm. I haven't tried it myself, but... Okay. Interesting idea. So here's a bit simpler rule. So it says clean, and this is what's called the target, and these are the commands. So one interesting thing about make is these here. It looks like it's spaces, but it's actually a tab character. So it always has to be tabs here. Um or else it doesn't work. So let's try running the make file using this clean rule. If I type make clean, it looks for all the targets, find one's name clean, and then runs it. So I do this, and then it prints out what the output is. So it removed the index.html, and it removed all of these other files here. OK, so now let's try making a, another file make pandemic uh let's see what are the pandemic files mm, pandemic okay so here i'm saying make pandemic pandemic.gml and then what will the it's input be target. It should use this and write out to there. So actually, before I do this, I want to remove this old rule from the make file because it might re override the simpler one here. So there we go. We see it ran Python 3 parse with this output. And it should have and we see now there's a bunch more files here, including pandemic.gml. So this is a little bit of a hack, and it includes, it also writes these other files here, which are not targets in the make file. But, well, this is a hack, so I didn't change it. Um, I don't know if there's a way to tell make that the same command makes multiple files, but anyway, it doesn't do it. So let's see, what can we do? So we here see here, make all outputs. So outputs is this other variable up here we see that says all of these different files here. So I can try that, make all. And now it goes through and makes everything. And when we contrast it to scripting languages, um, I think what is interesting about make files is declarative. We declare what depends on what, but we don't tell make file in which order it should do it. Right. And this is in contrast to scripts where we tell, you know, do this, then do that, then do this, and after you are mm -hmm. done, do the other step. Yeah. Here we can de declare it and we let make figure it out. Yeah. So let's try running make all again. We see it does nothing because it's all done. What if I touch a file? So touch will update the timestamp. Um here it makes only what is changed. So for 
simple task, this is really useful. Like Radovan said, you express the dependencies and let it figure out how to actually do the making. So let's see what else is down here in this make file. Um, I will remove this rule I copied. So I see there's a rule called setup, which does a bunch of echoing and produces this file index.html. And finalization just runs true, it does nothing. I wonder why I even put that in there. Maybe I was going to update it later. There's this rule that makes the actual, well, that runs everything. These extra rules also basically write something to the index.html. And then this GitHub pages rule does the whole deployment to GitHub pages. So we see there's these um, phony dependencies here. So GitHub pages will first clean everything. It will do the setup of the index file. It will make all of the outputs, and then it will do finalization, of which right now there is none. And then after it does all of these, it will run these git commands, which will check out a GitHub pages branch, actually make a new one, check in, add everything there, commit everything, and then push it to the GitHub pages branch on GitHub. So in this code here, it works. I'm actually a bit surprised it works, but this is not the main point here. We're gonna do this better with GitHub Actions later. The point is that we have sort of expressed it all with the make file. So now all I have to do whenever I update something, I can make all, okay, and then make GitHub pages. And then it deleted everything it's setting up the index file. It's running everything. Uh, taking a bit of time. Um, thanks for writing questions and suggestions uh, on GMD. Yeah, exactly. There's a great idea here. There's this phony target which basically is a way to declare that some of these targets are not real files. So we see here that GitHub pages is not a real file. Like there'll never be a file that's made that's called that. While here, there is a file called that. So you would normally do something like declare these, so these are all not real. And also something I'll often do is do default, which is all. Um, so by default, it runs the first target in the make file. I guess I could have just moved all to the top there, but here now I can adjust it later and make it explicit. Um, so just the default make will do this here. Okay, so if we go to GitHub here, um, if I go to the GitHub pages branch, we see that everything's been updated just now. Yep, one minute ago. And going here, we see it. So what we've got is some links to Board Game Geek, and then this tells well some other metadata I've defined, and things like the number of nodes, edges, average degree, well some basic graph statistics on it for all of them. So what we'll do later is I'd like to change from make to using snake make instead which I think will give me more power and control over doing this building. Um, and, uh, I think use case where make and snake make can really shine is uh, to parallelize workloads. Mm -hmm. apps that can be run independently. You can get parallelization for free. Yeah. I have used once to 
to make a deadline, which was over the weekend, and I <laughs> wouldn't have made it if I ran every analysis step one after another, mm -hmm. and I like paralyze it for me. Yeah, I could and run on twenty cores. Yeah. So, on chat, someone just reminded me of how it's done. So I clean. Uh, eight. Oh yeah, that's right. Make minus J. Yeah. So here it's running them all in parallel. So, yep. Yeah. Which is quite nice. Okay. So in the future, I'm going to take this project. I already talked about Snake Make. We'll make it use. We'll look a little bit more at GitHub Pages, and I also want to use GitHub Actions in order to automatically build it on every push. And maybe also talk a bit more about the data management aspects of this. So how, like how I'm trying to make the data reusable by other people. So that was a crash course introduction to make. Um, I think we'd maybe like- just a, Which oh, yeah. one of these is your favorite game? Which if you, one? If you can share. What was the question? Which of these is your favorite game currently? Hmm. I'd say Pandemic is still my favorite. Um, although there's one called On the Underground, which was recently re-released and I think is pretty good, but I haven't found people to play it enough yet. So, well, take that as it goes. Um, yeah. Maybe we can form a research software board game group. <laughs> okay. Like, um, yeah. So, so that, um, are we moving on to something else or? Yeah. So maybe we can see, um, we can go on. I think Radovan would like to show a little bit about Git, Git diff tool, and then we'll go to Q and A. So keep thinking of your workflow related questions and we can answer after that. So yes, and they can also be documentation related questions because after, mm. after like half time we want to have a bit of a look at how we document projects. Right. What yeah. Documentation I will show one thing that is like a simple thing. Yeah. Three minute, four minute thing that I use I don't know, almost daily. Yeah. Are you ready for your desktop? I'm ready. Okay. There you go. I have the terminal, I do. Mm -hmm. Here's a project that I have been working on now the last days. And this this trick that I use, uh, the tool is about uh, visual, com visual, having a look at visual differences in Git. Mm -hmm. um, I use this Git staging area a lot, Git status. I use Git status a lot. and. And, and after like a day of work, uh, when I'm about to really commit my changes, what I really like to do is to inspect the staging area. And one way to do that is oh, if I want to have a look, what, what did I really stage here? It would be maybe if git, diff, git diff head or cached mm -hmm. or staged, staged. Uh, but it, if if I did many changes, it can be really a little bit hard to browse these changes. So there there were lines removed, the red ones. Some lines were added, the green ones. Maybe I I left some print statements, or some debug statements. So what I really like to do is I like to look at it side by side. And for this, I have install, installed a visual differencing tool. And what I like to do very often is instead of diff, I like to use git diff to yeah. diff to cached. And what it does, it it opens uh, the the comparison side by side. Mm -hmm. And here I can scroll up and down. On the left side is the version before. On the right side is the version after. Mm -hmm. I will now switch to maybe to the next file here. And then, right, yeah. If and I can take these changes, like if I want the old change better, I can take the old change. If I want to get, remove a change, I can remove this change. And I use that to also find some debug debug statements that I left, left behind. Let's see if I left something in the other file. Hmm. Uh, so this is instance, meld, right? 
This is using Melt. It's only one of the one of many uh, visual diff tools that you can couple it with. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I will do. Do you have to configure it specially? You you don't really have to. You okay. can put it in your config. Mm -hmm. I don't. I'm not even sure I did. Um, you need you need to install one of the many. So there is Melt, there is Diffuse here. It's one of these many tools. And Git can work with any of these, but you can then set mm -hmm. your favorite one in the Git config. And yeah. I'm using Melt. I just wanted to show one more example here because next file. Did I leave any print statement here? Here is a debug print. And I use that mm -hmm. then to clean up. Yeah. Once I'm happy, save. And you can click uh, save. So does it edit the, when you edit the files here, does it edit the working directory files? Yes. Okay. The working directory. And then you have then to add I'm... it back again. And I also learned yesterday from you about the word diff, which is a nice alternative also, which I don't have installed, but we can, mm. you can look at differences not line by line, but it will, it will highlight yeah. the words that have changed. Try git diff cached dash dash word diff. Cached word diff. Like this? Yeah. I don't know mm -hmm. if it's right, but let's see. Yeah. Yeah. No whether Try dash I... dash word diff equals color. Yeah, I think. So I, here... But I think also in this case, all the changes that I did are mm -hmm. really lines. Mm -hmm. what, um, uh, word diff equals color. Color not a separate option. And yeah, so hmm. let me try that out. Uh, let's make a change where we change one word here. I remove something, and now let's see. Hmm. Mm. It's cached. I need to do head here. This is what mm -hmm. I want to show. Yeah, it's the one. So it will not it will not mark uh, the line, but it will show which word this word got removed. Yeah, this word was uh, edited. It in this case it didn't really understand that I removed that part, but mm -hmm. it's already pretty good. Yeah. So it's yeah, and there's some sort of configuration I did for it to adjust what it considered a word, but I mean, by default, it's pretty good. So yeah, this is yep. basically my default way of using the git diff on a daily basis. Hmm. Yeah. I use diff, I use merge tool yeah. uh, for anything that, that doesn't fit, fit into the screen. Yeah. But for big stuff, I use Merge Tool because Meld is really good. So that was the quick thing that I wanted to show. Maybe it's time to look at questions. Yeah, let's see what people are saying. So for workflows, how do you deal with uh, when a pipeline for reproducible expensive steps fails at some point? Mm. Maybe something like a make file gets confused. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think you mean one of the steps fails and it takes a lot of time to run. So I think part of this is, I would say that when you are, by, by having it in the make file, it's really easy to rerun only the parts that fail. So basically one of the job steps fails, but you define enough different rules before then that all the rules before that point did succeed and then you're able to um just see like it knows what worked and it doesn't run that again basically a big advantage compared to a script oh, which typically you go in and you comment out some lines that you think mm -hmm. that finished to continue the to not redo the expensive steps yeah, and I have workflow tools which will then only run what hasn't been, mm -hmm. what is not uh, yeah. completed. 
now. So basically, make is what you need for this kind of stuff. Mm. Okay. About documentation, which I think yeah. I can come come back to in a moment when we are going to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Oh, you... right. Yeah, you're going to talk about that in the second half. Audience. And I think it's a really good point. So when we write mm -hmm. documentation, we have to keep in mind that there are really different audiences mm -hmm. reading it. It's not clear to me always. Yeah. But I will come back to it. Yes. Okay. But we welcome questions. Also, yeah. uh, somebody mentioned this observable HQ, which I didn't know yet, but I will have a look. So thanks for yeah. sharing that. You want to take a look at it now? Or do you want to go on? Maybe we can look at it in the epilogue. Yeah. Okay. 20 minutes left, 25. Yeah. So, uh, Radovan, you had you said you had some alias to set up Python virtual environments automatically from a requirements.txt. Yes. Uh, and you said that you showed me, but I forgot. So can you show me again what it's like? Do you want your yes. desktop to be displayed? Yep. Because also this, in fact, it has evolved a bit after last time we talked about that. OK. Let's take a look. How was that? So I'm using fish functions. Mm. I have this earlier. Mm -hmm. I have another one E2 if I want to have a Python 2. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, OK. Oh, yeah. uh, now nice. this is looking familiar. Yeah. It's the old one. I can. I use um, Git pool origin master. I synchronize my uh, my aliases through. I share them on GitHub, and I have set that on a different computer, but not on this one. Mm -hmm. So now let's try that again. Functions ve. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, it mm -hmm. it. Uh, it has evolved, but here I see an older version. I'm not sure why. Yeah. But what what I do is I set up the virtual environment. Yeah. I source it. Then I test does it contain requirements mm. of text mm -hmm. installed to it. I think on the other computer maybe I forgot to push, but the one improvement that I did is that if a directory VNF exists already, then I do not rerun this step. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I so in a directory which already, already contains a virtual environment. I go in, yeah. I tap VE, and I have everything set up. Mm -hmm. And I also go and modify this file, and then I can run VE again. Mm -hmm. hmm. OK. And yeah. synchronize uh, aliases across machines. Yeah. So I guess I need to make a bash version, for, version of this for myself. So. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can present that next week. Um, also, here's an interesting poll for our audience. Who uses what shell? So I use Bash. I don't know if that makes me old now or not. Um, I've just got so much to find in my Bash RC file that it's so customized, I haven't seen it worth changing to something else. Why do you use Bash on fish? computers? Because there, other things break on other, with other shells. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fair enough. OK. Should we go on then? Yeah, I think let's go on. I wanted to talk a little bit about documentation. Mm -hmm. And also, I wanted to maybe I still have the screen share. I can start from here because we have these research software our notes where we collect ideas and we also welcome suggestions and we got one contribution here a code example so this was offered by one of our watchers a repository which is a really beautiful example of, of how uh, documentation is nicely set up and I wanted to browse it and comment it. There are some, some really nice choices and I learned new things from it. 
I will open that here. And maybe before I browse it and comment a bit, uh, I wanted to start and connect also to the question that we got, and it's about the perspective. And I was reflecting a bit about documentation also when preparing the lesson for this morning when we when we were teaching docu documentation at the code refinery workshop. I was thinking how my own perspective changed. Like when I started coding, my perspective was looking at the source code and I was writing documentation in the source code. And I thought that everybody's looking at the source code because that's that was my perspective. I really didn't have the perspective of a user mm. only later. I, I didn't have the perspective of somebody working at the supercomputer who installed this who installs the code and maybe mm. doesn't want to read many, many pages. Uh, also, I didn't have the perspective of somebody who maybe doesn't go doesn't even have access to the source code or doesn't have access to GitHub, GitLab, but gets the software in a completely different way. So this this change of perspective. Then uh, maybe the most important point for me in terms of documentation, there are many tools and I think we, I will mention a couple of them, but really the most important point that, that I learned is to put the documentation with the project into the same repository. And this is the case here also. So here the documentation is part of the Git repository here under doc. And that is really important for, it is really important for reproducibility. Let's see whether we have branches here. Because the code has branches, mm -hmm. it has versions, it evolves, and it is good if the documentation has at least a chance to evolve with with the, with the code. And if I s try out a new idea on a side branch, then it's nice if I have a, the possibility to also document it in the same place. Mm -hmm. So it, I think it, for me, that's a, that's a must. It has to go uh, with the code. But of course, it does not mean that I'm consuming the documentation only by looking at the repository. So from the repository, we can then generate websites. And this is the case here. So here's the here's the generated documentation. And then later we can zoom in and have a look how this is really done. But this is the generated, really beautiful documentation, which is versioned and it has examples. And there is interfaces are documented. And the examples, they there is this nice gallery of examples where I can go in and I have annotated annotated code examples that I can copy paste into my terminal and I can try it out. So this this web, or this HTML documentation is generated from, from the sources. The sources are here and the, the documentation sources are here on the doc. Yeah. This is restructured text, RST. Yeah. So I think the author of this is in the chat. So I was wondering, how do you make the HTML out of the Python scripts? Is it some, um, oh yeah. Oh, uh, you mean the, what? which tool is, that is? Yeah. Okay. So I, he says it's okay. called Sphinx Gallery. Okay. I didn't know of that, but. So that is really, this nice. is just something I learned today while looking at this example, Sphinx Gallery. I don't know, I have it here open. No, I don't have it open. Um, Sphinx Gallery. What really nice extension of Sphinx. And the idea is that, uh, let's go to the code repository. The idea is that you have examples. These are the example files. They are executable and you can yeah. annotate them. And the annotation becomes the documentation. Okay. And how is this built? Oh, there are these GitHub workflows. So these are GitHub actions. These are, there is one to run tests. There is another one to build the documentation. And here on the master branch, on every push and every pull request, something is happening. And I think here somewhere there is make HTML. Mm -hmm. Aha, uh -huh. so there are files. What does that okay. mean? That looks this like guy. maybe the Sphinx make file that 
has something. a rule like that. Snake file, which mm -hmm. runs this configuration. And in here, when I scroll down, 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 there are lots of settings. But in at the end of it, there is this configuration for the Sphinx gallery. Mm -hmm. So you point where are the examples, then some settings, and it will generate this documentation from these examples. Mm -hmm. I think it's really, really neat. Um, yeah. I wanted to, I promised that I would mention a couple of tools. So this is Sphinx. Sphinx can take restructured text or markdown uh, and generate HTML. I like Sphinx a lot. And I think one reason why Sphinx got a lot of traction is because there is this service called Read the Docs. Read the docs.org, which can, where you can host documentation. So it will build Sphinx for me. But th this is not the, the only tool. So Sphinx is just, it's always the same idea. There is make MK docs and there is, a, there is a Git book and there is Jekyll and Hugo and an RST to HTML and package down in the R world. It's always the same concept, but I really like this approach. Uh, we keep Markdown or RST. They can be, and we, we, we generate HTML. Maybe in addition to it, uh, extracting annotation from the source code to document in APIs, interfaces, and to build these nice examples. What else did I wanted to show here? Yeah. So what about the different documentation for different user groups? So there's users versus developers versus, yeah. I mean, I guess it so depends the, on what you're targeting at the beginning. So. Right. So for the, the user, I think will be maybe most interested in getting quickly up to speed, mm -hmm. how to install, how to try it out. Does it fit my use case? Um, a developer might be interested in knowing how can I even contribute to this thing? Can mm -hmm. I, am I allowed to modify it? How can I modify it? How can I test it? A, a developer will be maybe interested in, as a developer, I would be interested in tests. Mm -hmm. Want to know how to run them. Because if I make changes, I want to know that I break something. And what is nice here is that it's documented. Right. Yeah, I, how, how, how can I do development? How can I get up to speed? As a developer, I might be interested in the API. If I'm, because here are the functions I want to know, or as a user, I mean, I want to know what, what do these functions do? What do they expect? What comes out of it? Mm -hmm. as, as a support person on a supercomputer, I'm mostly interested in, I want to know how to install it. I don't want to do read yeah. everything here. And I want to know, did I install it correctly? Is it, does it produce the mm -hmm. correct results? And mm -hmm. the second question I might have is, uh, is it efficient? Yeah. Like, does it work? Yeah, because there's sometimes I've had to install something for someone and I say, okay, it's here. I don't know if it works. Please tell me, <laughs> which is a funny position to be in. Exactly, because often often we install, oh, I'm, I'm helping uh, researchers with reinstalling code and I don't, I don't know nothing about, I don't know anything about this code. Mm -hmm. So for, I would then appreciate to see documentation which tells me that does this work as expected. And again, mm -hmm. I would then appreciate automated tests. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And these examples are, I think, wonderful for, yeah, for users to get started, yeah. to see also not only, to not only see what is possible, so not only to see a reference documentation, but also to see how do I get started? What are good defaults? What is a good starting point, which I then later can adapt? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is automatically done. So automatically, on every push, and then I think this is something that you will want to do with your networks. Also, is that at the end, this these HTML artifacts mm -hmm. are uploaded. Okay, and then is they this... end up uh, then they end up over here. So is this uploaded as a release or not a release, but just? The way I interpret every commit. it, oh, I interpreted that it would happen on every push. Hmm. But you have a different workflow then, which yeah. in, instead of 
push says release mm -hmm. and it would some, something can happen only uh, when you release the code and i use yeah. these i use this approach to for okay. instance upload packages to the python package index yeah or to to conda forge okay so he says in chat right now it's just an artifact and not automatically pushed so maybe okay. this is an artifact in the github actions workflow view yeah. or something like that so i think this is really a nice example the sphinx gallery is something i will use yeah um i browsed a bit i think if i can give one suggestion one thing that i would change and maybe to give back i can contribute that is the following let me clone it get the clone Uh, I wanted to show you the the one tiny little thing I will change would be if I look at the setup. Okay, here we have installation requirements. Mm. We have really version ranges, which is okay now. Uh, but at some point, it could be nice to specify. Uh, we could we could have a look at uploading this to to really PyPI. Mm -hmm. But this is also a nice way of installing from Git. But I want the thing that I wanted to show is the version. So personally, uh, here let's do Git grab the version. Uh, it is, and I've been through this myself. So it is set in it is set in the configuration for the Sphinx. It is also set mm -hmm. in the double under in it. It is also right. set in the setup UI. Yeah. Maybe there is a script that sets all these things, but what I have seen in my codes is that at some point I will forget to to change this one. <laughs> yeah, there is a way. Yeah. So what I would do, and maybe I can I can contribute that. I would I would specify it only here, and one can then infer the information. So in the setup.py, I can I can fetch it from here. Yeah, and also the conflict.py, I can fetch it from there. And I have an example of how I do that. In so this is also Sphinx doc conf, and this will just take one minute, and then I'll give the mic back. Here, yeah, here I import it into the Sphinx, and then on the setup.py, where is it? In the setup.py, I do. Okay. I do this this here. You open, yeah. I've seen something like that before. <laughs> A couple of days ago, I've seen something even much nicer, which was uh, to do that in setup.config, setup.cfg. Mm -hmm. I was now browsing this afternoon. I couldn't find it anymore. Maybe, maybe I was dreaming it. But there is, I, I've seen a yet nicer way of uh, mm -hmm. importing this. But anyway, I would prefer to have that in one place only so that I don't forget to update it in three places. Mm -hmm. But I really appreciate this project. I think this is. Uh, yeah, it's a really a good great. example. It's something that also, really looks like you want to use too. Yeah. Example Just... usage. This is great. I always like that to have here. I would copy paste that and try it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you say find the minimum versions of the dependencies, what I'll often do is start off without that. And as I figure out what they are, then I'll list them. Or if I have some way of knowing, but then otherwise sort of just assume that as time goes on, it becomes a moot point because everyone has something greater than that. But and here, this is a whole package. And sometimes, but sometimes I get one script. And then I often start with this alias that I have. So I go in and as, as you do as well, I try to run it without anything. Then I see mm -hmm. how there is needs, mm -hmm. it needs Panda. Then I add, I add pandas to my requirements of text. Mm -hmm. Install this one. I run it again. I realize now it needs NumPy. Yeah. So I have really similar as you. Mm -hmm. No, I'm thinking a lot. There is much more to say about, about yeah. documentation. So, but, but I guess we'll get to that yeah. later. Yes. Yeah, we can come back to that. Yeah. It would be neat to make a whole Sphinx project from scratch. So yeah, which... we can do that. Yeah. Uh, so, so if somebody has a code uh, and you would like to have a documentation like this, but unsure where to start, maybe contribute that code and we could do it on stream. 
you can yeah. go in and, and build it. I think it could be really fun. Mm -hmm. It's not, it doesn't take much and we could, we could manage in half an hour to yeah. get something going. Yeah. And deploy it to, to read the docs. Yeah. Should we use the remaining time? There are a couple of things we could, we can still show a few small things. Yeah. I was curious about units. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is not exactly about software, but if you're listening to this, you might find it useful. Let me switch to my screen. Yep. So um, there's a little Linux and I guess other operating system program called units. So it lets you, well, convert units, just like it says. So for example, one meter in, uh, let's say, feet, 3.28. Or you can do more complicated things like, um, what's a more complicated conversion? Something time related or something. Mm, let's do a network traffic conversion. So 10 um, megabit in one week, how many gigabytes is that? Hmm, it doesn't work, why? Ah, megabit per second, M. So that's 700 gigabytes. There's many different versions of similar thing. Can you write this also like on one line? Can I say units? something to something, I don't know, gallons to liters, or it's interactive, like it is asking uh, these questions. Units, one week. So, yeah, you can do things like that too. Um, it's got all the physical units in there, although these days that's not what I use very often. Um, you can do arithmetic in here, so say five meters squared per, mm, let's see, what's a force calculation here or something like that? Oh, mm, ah, five square meters in feet squared. So this is a shorthand for the exponent and we've converted it to that much. Um, yeah, so just a little short thing I had that I thought that people could be interested in. It sure has saved me a lot of time doing calculations. And this is basically what you can get with Google or DuckDuckGo if you enter it in, but here you've got it just with yourself. So, yeah. Oh, nice. So we have some more or I had one question for you. So in some of the pull requests I see you make, there's one pull request and many small commits. So each change you do a little commit there. So how do you manage these? Do you have editor integration? So you make a change and you commit or do you commit from the command line? Because usually I make small pull request, but each pull request has a lot of different commits in it, or I don't have mm -hmm. lots of small commits within mm -hmm. that pull request. It's some commits with a lot of unrelated changes. Yeah. So how, maybe how and why, so how I do that, I don't use any integrations. I think I should, but I use Vim really for editing, and then I go mm -hmm. to a different terminal tab and I do everything from the command line. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that, uh, many of my uh, friends and colleagues use really sophisticated setups where you can go, you can do everything from yeah. the editor directly. Mm -hmm. And there are extensions for really any any of these editors, MX, Vim. Yeah. You can do that directly. So I don't. I, I switch editor, I go to the command line, I use git status all the time, mm -hmm. stay area all the time. Yeah. And why do I do these small commits? Because I believe it makes review a bit easier because mm -hmm. well, I try to use good commit messages so that you don't have to look at the whole change, but you can maybe look at some of them mm -hmm. separately. Mm -hmm. but for me, what 
what, what uh, the reason why I do that for me is that if I know that this is a good change and maybe it may be a small change, but I know it's a good change, I mm -hmm. commit it and I get it out of my way. And then mm -hmm. my staging area is more manageable. So then, then I have yeah. less to think about. And so my, my staging area reduces. Yeah. I get the thing out of the way mm -hmm. until, until there is nothing left in the staging area. Yeah. And That's do you use do. dash M on the command line to commit these? What was that? Dash... Do you use dash M on the command line to edit the message or have the message directly there? Well, I edit. I, I almost never use dash M. I mm. always wait for the editor to open. OK. And I think this is just a habit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, In that's bit... I use a lot when I want to stage everything, all the changes, so that I yeah. use all the time. Yeah. So I like to have small commits because it's always it's very easy to combine them and it's easy to reorder them and it's easy to take mm -hmm. them away. Mm -hmm. Once I commit, it's always more, more more work to split it up. Yeah, that's why. But may, I, I don't know how it feels to the person reviewing it. So maybe it, yeah. maybe the person reviewing would appreciate to have less less of these commits. Yeah, when I review, I've always looked at just the overall differences in what has changed. But I recently saw that in one of the views, you can push P and N in order to navigate the commits in order. So like I can start with the first commit and do N, 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 N to see each change individually, which I think could make reviewing a lot yeah. easier. So I've, mm -hmm. I want to explore this a little bit and see if it's useful. It's also something I saw flying by, but I haven't used it yet. But you can mark also files and commits as already visited. So if, mm -hmm. if you're working with you and it takes several days because it's a lot of work, you can mark what you have already looked at and then you mm -hmm. can take take it up again the next day and you don't you, you know what you have you know checked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something I haven't used myself yet. Yeah. It's a good idea. Hmm. Do you have any questions here? Yeah, let's Check the questions. For the okay. shell survey, I see two people said bash, two said ZSH, one TCSH, and that's it. Yeah, my history was so I started with yeah, bash, then, then Z shell, then fish. Mm -hmm. So you think fish is an improvement on? ZSH. I like the tab completion. Mm -hmm. It has a predictive autocomplete. Mm -hmm. I also like context aware history. So it's not just the history, but it it will apply the history in the context that I'm in, in the directory that I'm in. Hmm. So, okay. So if I directory, it will not present me the same history because the history there is not relevant yeah. from the from the other space, other place. And does it save I, the history in your home directory, but yes, with but a tag I, of where? Yes, but I think it 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 saves it in like path aware and tool aware. Mm -hmm. hmm. So it will it will also not let me auto complete commands that kind of make no sense. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. If I try to do something that is I don't know on a file that is not there, it uh, it changes the color. I find yeah. it very helpful. Hmm. I also like. Uh, they they didn't try to be backwards compatible to everything else. Mm -hmm. So some of, of the settings which were really arcane got mm -hmm. changed. Okay. Is there a different syntax for functions in it than in Bash? It's yeah, it's different, and it's I think things are a little bit simpler, but they are also different. So if mm -hmm. you are used to, it takes some getting unused to mm -hmm. when you switch some of the. Yeah. Some, of, some of the commands that we use all the time. So I guess I'd have to basically rewrite my bash RC file to use it. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, yeah. you've got me more interested now. You can have a little, I can do a demo next time. Yeah. Yeah, we uh, would like to have more questions. So I'm, I'm really asking, so my, my one meta question is how can we get more questions? I don't know, maybe we should announce the event sooner. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, how can we get more people watching? Do you think this is interesting to other people? How can we reach them? 
Yeah. Maybe more aggressive advertisement. <laughs> we of course, yeah. will try. So in the next shows, we are looking at. We will try also with interviews. We want to have code submissions so that we can look at these. I think mm -hmm. the more this is community contributed, the better it will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've done very little advertising myself, so. Yeah, I mean the last days it was. Where? So racing behind deadlines, it was very busy. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully, today didn't suffer too much here, and yeah. we show some interesting things. Yeah, I think today was a great session. Let's see. Call it all. Yeah. Do you want to look at this that? observable tool? Say it again. The observable tool, which someone suggested in HackMD. Um, do you want to open it or should I? Yeah, I can, I can have a look. Observable HQ. Okay. I'm displaying your desktop. Mm -hmm. So is it like, is it like Jupyter notebooks? So it's notebooks, it's JavaScript. It looks very interactive. Oh yeah. That looks like interactive hmm. notebooks is that uh, yeah something to something to explore so any gallery here yeah maybe is it collaborative can can several people Work on it at the same time. Maybe I can plug one more thing that I started experimenting recently, and that's Deep Note. Deep Note, which is, which looks like a Jupyter notebook, and I think it's built on notebooks. But you can have several people editing at the same time. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Jupyter not supporting simultaneous editing is a bit of a issue, which I hope they will work on. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think, and so it is. A, it is a non issue since yeah. quite. A, I think it's not really trivial to do. Yeah, but also part of that comes from Jupyter being something you can just run as a single process on your own computer, and not something tied to a multi-user server intrinsically. So if you want multiple people to edit and it's running on your own computer, well, they're all gonna have access to all of your data without being sandboxed. So that's hmm, interesting. Okay, should we? Yeah, let's see. I think so. we've answered all the questions. Um. Yeah, so I guess are we, um, I guess we're basically done now. So. Um, Please let us uh, send code and suggestions and ideas and questions our way. Yeah. The more we would really like to, to have easy questions, difficult mm -hmm. questions. Let us know how we can make this more interesting. Yeah. And thanks so much for, for watching. Thanks for your time. And yeah. thanks, Richard. Well, thanks for being here. So, yes, bye for now, everyone. See Have you next morning. week. Good morning, afternoon. See you next week.